I want you to warm up the air with a little love for Clifton Snyder. This book began, uh, but it probably began the night I heard that John Lennon uh, had been shot and murdered. I'll never forget that moment. I was in the dance club and this uh, friend of mine came in onto the dance floor actually and said he, he couldn't believe it that somebody shot John Lennon. And so that eventually ended up in uh, this book, but the original version of this book, I should say, a number of the poems were published, uh, but I didn't find a publisher for the book until now, and I, I was going through my boxes, this is explained in the preface, uh, I was going through my boxes to donate archives to uh, the LGBT uh, collection at USC, and I found this manuscript, and I looked at it, and I said, hmm. So I, I went through it, and I thought, well, some of these are not so bad, and uh, I cut some of them that I thought were bad, and revised others, and that's enough about that. Uh, are you all familiar with the Beatles? Uh, <laughs> you know, they, what, what uh, a little quiz here. Where did they come from in England? Liverpool. Very good. And they used to perform at the Cavern Club in Liverpool. Yeah, uh, I've been to Liverpool. And, but, Stupid people in Liverpool made a parking lot out of what, out of what was the Cavern Club. Uh, they, they, by the time I got there in December of 83, they weren't so stupid anymore. Because you go to the train station and you can get a map of all the Beatles sites, and I got one. And I went to Penny Lane, Strawberry Field, uh, Matthew Street, which is where the Cavern Club was. Did, did I see a hand raised? Yeah, I had a question. Which Beatles are your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I suppose that's the inevitable question. Uh, probably John uh, and George and Ringo and Paul last. <laughs> Even though he's the most prolific and creative one. I like them all. Uh, but um, if I had to choose, it would probably be in that order. I love to talk. <laughs> uh, I actually got to see Ringo perform last fall. He was in Costa Mesa at the Sequestrum uh, uh, Hall, and he's really good. He has a fantastic band. He calls it his all-star band, and he had people that used to be in Santana. Todd Rundgren was there, and all the music was terrific. Anyway, in the 70s, I uh, got into Carl Jung. Has anybody seen the movie Almost Famous? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. The, do you remember the professor uh, in that? She's talking about Jungian psychology. It was very hot in the, in the uh, 70s. And I, and I picked that up and I used it to study literature. And it occurred to me that the Beatles are an archetypal phenomenon. Anytime you have the crowds that they had and, and the adulation that they had, there's something in the collective psyche that responds to them. And so, usually I don't write consciously about Jungian you know, uh, archetypes, but I did when I was writing this book. And so here's the uh, Cavern Club. In the middle of the day, masses of teenagers queued up to step down 18 paces into an ex-wine cellar. They say that girls and boys fainted from the density of bodies, smoke and smell of cheese, meat pies, piss and sweat. They say the noise was raunch raunchy, ecstatic, suffocating talk. They say the sweat from the band shorted out their guitars. Still the four of them sang under arches of old brick. Ringo, the kid next door, the little big-nosed clown, 
George, the comely, mystic baby, Paul, the sentimental mama, wailing away with his partner, rude, sensitive, assertive Papa John. Ron Howard gave a movie years out last year, called Eight Days a Week, about the touring years of the Beatles. Has anybody seen it? I recommend it if you haven't seen it. Uh, one of the little known facts about the Beatles when they toured was that uh, people would bring their handicapped uh, relatives and there was, they'd sit in the front row and, uh, or in a special section for them and they got to go backstage and they came for the healing music, that's the name of this poem, uh, which is another example of why they're an archetypal phenomenon. Uh, in those days, it wasn't very PC, but they called them cripples. And uh, one of John Lennon's songs talks about how it's hard to be crippled inside, you know. Um, anyway, here I am talking to you. Let me read the poem. <laughs> the healing music. The front row was set apart for them. The half-wits, the blind, the deaf, the paralyzed, brought by their grandparents, their parents, aunts and uncles, sisters and brothers, to hear the healing music, to feel it, to touch its makers, who sang like gods, slammed the drums, beat their feet, plucked their strings, shook their heads, screamed the magic in the dressing rooms. The relatives wheeled them in. They held out their withered hands, dripping saliva, twisting their heads, showing the whites of their eyes, begging for one touch. All they got was the word, the word in the healing music. And you know, I got that from the song, The Word. And you know what the word is? Love. In the Pentecostal church that I was raised in, my father was the minister, we weren't supposed to listen to popular music. Uh, but I did anyway, you know, you couldn't avoid it. I remember the first time I heard I Want to Hold Your Hand, and I loved it. Uh, when I went away, away to college, I started doing everything I wasn't supposed to do, <laughs> including not only listening to popular music, but buying it. And I bought this album called Yes, The Beatles, Yesterday and Today. In fact, I think it's the first album by the Beatles that I ever bought. And years later, you know, when I became a Beatle maniac in the early 80s, I was reading about this album. It was a Capitol Record album. It's not at um, Parlophone, which is what the label was for the Beatles until they had Apple. Uh, and I read that underneath some of the copies of this was a band cover. Uh, Capitol Records saw this and they panicked because this is what it looked like. I don't know if you can see that in the back. It's called the butcher's cover or the butcher's sleeve. And uh, in Ron Howard's movie, you can see the photo session and various uh, pictures from this session. And, and they used it for to advertise a single in England. Nobody raised an eyebrow. But Capitol Records saw this, and they really they, they ordered all the records destroyed. But some of them were not destroyed. They were just covered with this. And uh, I was reading this in bed one night. Uh, with my partner at the time, and I thought, you know, I have that album. And so I went and looked. There's a little, maybe I'll pass this around. There's a little place here that I used to keep my albums in the living room, and my cat would piss there. And this is cat piss, and, and so the, the cover had lifted up a little bit, and I looked, and this was underneath it. It was like discovering buried treasure, it really was. So my partner, luckily, was much better than I am at these kinds of things, and he steamed this off for me. I've since discovered it's more valuable if you don't steam it off. <laughs> but what can I say? I've got it, and I ain't going to part with it <laughs> or sell it. But I'll pass this around. I don't lug it around to greetings for obvious reasons. And I have no idea that uh, writing about other people's art is called ekphrastic poetry. It's 
It's really popular now, but I was doing it a million years ago. The Butcher's Sleeve, 1966, it's in two parts. One, each wears a turtleneck and a white, slightly dirty butcher smock. Paul, the sweetest beetle, is smack in the middle, smirking like the others, with mouth wide open and a headless doll carcass on either shoulder. Half a set of false teeth rests on his right arm, while his left hand sits delicately as on a guitar on the smudged head of a doll. Standing above Paul, George holds another severed head, and to the left, John has one in his lap. Behind a long chunk of butchered meat, and bone. Not exactly your mop tops. <laughs> Other chunks lie on the shoulders of Paul and John, on the laps of Paul and Ringo, on John's lapel and in Ringo's pocket. Every beetle shows his teeth, especially George and John. Two, Capitol Records panics withdraws the cover, replaces it with a photo of the four tight-lipped, motley-attired, resentful beetles posing around a steamer trunk, disgusted, having sold their right to have a say. Thank you. And the say they wanted to have, according to Paul and John, anyway, was an anti-Vietnam War statement, uh, which because of their image they couldn't make publicly. Well, I have a couple of fan letters, I, and I hope I can get through this without laughing. <laughs> I tried to put myself in, in the mind of one of the screaming girls at one of their concerts. Um, and this later actually led to my novel, which is back there, to give the plug for it, Loud Whisper, which is about a band in the 80s, and I start out with a fan of, of the frontman for this band. Okay, this is the fan letter uh, from Terre Haute, Indiana, where I happened to live once when I was a child, to a university college hospital, London, England. It's when Ringo was in the hospital for getting his tonsils out. Dearest Ringo, when I heard about your tonsils, I felt so bad. I just know you're going to be all right. I wish you could see the spelling and everything in here. Love is spelled L-U-V, of course. You look so cute in those striped PJs. If that doctor hurts you one teeny bit, I'll murder him. Promise. Because Ringo, I love you. All in capital letters. Three exclamation marks. It's always been me and you. No offense to your pals. But just between we two, I think Paul stuck up. John's a brain. Don't get me wrong, he's cute all right, and I love the way he shakes his head. Paul too. And George, I can't stand. I drew fangs on his picture. It's you I love, L-U-V. Ringo, you've got more talent in your little finger than all their mothers. So who's this Maureen girl mm. seeing you in the hospital? Please tell her for me, for us. I'm your true love, okay? And one more thing, please, please, can I have your tonsils? I promise I'll cherish them forever, for with the ditches. <laughs> promise, and you can see them anytime you're in Terre Haute, Ringo, I love you. And don't marry that hat, you'll be sorry. Love you forever, Sherry. <laughs> okay, now I get to use this. This is a Indian uh, instrument from uh, the Hanuman Temple in Taos, New Mexico. And guess which beetle this reminds me of? Joey. Yes. I don't have. I knew nothing about cartel. This is a cartel. Uh, when I wrote this book, and I don't know that he used them. He's famous for using the sitar. 
But this is my one sonnet in the book, the, Re the Beatles Record. They don their magical mystery caps. They descend into the studio where they are comfy, instruments in their laps, guitar picks in hands, drumsticks in the air. George Martin, mentor, comes steno, sits down, ready to write, perform, or simply wait. Mama Paul strums his tune to Papa John, who sings, adding words to the Middle Ages. George brings in a tabla and a sitar. Papa John, Mama Paul, and Ringo watch indulgent as George plays lead guitar and sings. Not quite like that. Overdubbing tracks. Then, bingo. They add woodwinds, strings, brass, moog, and bells. Anything for what they want and what sells. I have a couple of quotes from Brian Epstein. Um, as a gay man, and naturally I was drawn to him because he was gay. And, and uh, if it hadn't been for Brian Epstein, we wouldn't know the Beatles as we know them. Uh, he uh, found them a record contract after every other company had turned them down. The last house on the block was Parlophone Records with George Martin. And uh, he got them a contract. When their first single, Love Me Do, came out, he bought 10,000 copies because that's how many copies it took to put it on the charts. And he hit them, and he had a record store, he hid them in the back so nobody would know that he did that. Those were just a few of the things. And guess which Beatle he was in love with? John. Right, exactly, John Lennon. Mm -hmm. And this is my epigraph for this poem to Brian of Stein after he died at the young age of 32. We loved him and he was one of us, said John Lennon. And I mentioned MBEs, they, they were awarded the, what is that, Master of the British Empire? This award from the Queen of England and- um, Order, the MBE Order of the British Empire. Well, I have an MBE mm -hmm. and you'll see why it works in the, in the poem. Um, anyway, Supposedly, they smoked pot in a, in a restaurant before they accepted the medals. I've just been reading about that again. That some of them tell a different story. They said they just had a smoke, so of tobacco. Who cares? I mean, to Brian Epstein, was selling furniture a bore? Did the boys give you satisfaction you never got from acting or designing dresses and windows? Was John a wet dream? Was your fantasy safer in dry cleaned hair, tailored suits and ties, and polished boots? MBE, said George and Paul, really stands for Mr. Brian Epstein. When you saw your MBEs in front of thousands screaming and creaming, you wept openly, you blushed, you gambled, cruised rough trade, pretended to be what you were not. You discovered fear where there was love. Hmm. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Frank Kearns is responsible for making this book. And I really appreciate that. Uh, Los Nietos. Nietos? I guess it was Nietos Press. And of course, Roy is again responsible for the cover. And a, a, nice, a friend of mine did the uh, author photo. So uh, I have another acrostic poem on John Lennon's erotic lithographs. And it so happens that I bought this copy of Avant Garde. This is not the copy, this is the picture of the copy. Uh, in 19. 70, March 1970. And as you can see, if, maybe you can't see, it says John Lennon's erotic lithographs. It also had a homoerotic poem by my favorite poet, W.H. Autumn, which is published unauthorized in the same edition. 
But um, John uh, made these lithos. He, he didn't, I did a little more research on this. He, he didn't do it the traditional way. He was too lazy to do that. But somebody was after him to do lithographs. So they gave him material that he could draw. And he was a good artist. He went to art school in Liverpool. And it became, the pro I don't know the whole process, but it became these lithos. And if you don't mind seeing what a lot of people would consider naughty pictures, I'll pass these around. Uh, the lithographs were confiscated in Britain, and they tried to uh, prosecute Lenin, but they found out that they couldn't do that. It's a long story. But uh, you know how they are about such things. John Lennon's erotic lithographs. He drew the lines quick, like their relationship, thick, stringy, imprecise. Her hat, floppy, stern, like his trousers, white, modern. The groom and his bride. Her fingers adore, she beckons to lips and more, her legs open wide. So her body slops as he slithers through and plops his penis inside. John and Yoko breathe, their flabby bodies yoked, seized by love, peace, and pride. Can't write about the Beatles without writing about love and peace and peace and love. Gregos loves to do this, and uh, he always ends his concerts with "Give peace a chance." I've got the video. In fact, I should post that. I have a, a Facebook page, which I hope you'll all like on the Beatles. <laughs> all right, uh, tonight, uh, as you probably know, people are marching. In the airport, JFK Airport in uh, New York and in Atlanta. Rock music was sinful after all, 
blasphemous, devil-inspired noise, elemental and thrilling. Had I seen the faces of the zealots who built the fires across the Bible Belt, the same hideous faces one sees in pictures of lynch mobs, the same glassy stares, the self-satisfied grins, had I seen them, I might have guessed what already I sensed, what John had said. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. Mm -hmm. Okay, the title poem is called The Beetle Bump. Let's all do the beetle bump. First we strum a little banjo, then we bop, 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 a bee bop, a lula, then we pop a lot of prellies, do a little body, add a Brian, bump Mr. Best, and fall into a hole. Now we please, please everybody. We pump promoters, we hump groupies, and we plump for the queen. We listen to the colors of our movies. We jump to the beat of a psychedelic band. Man, we sure been naughty girls dripping up the barefoot clown purple, sipping, yellow, creeping sounds. So we do the beetle bump, we jump, we stump, we slump, we sit, we search, we never stop. We pump our money bags, we clump our peckers in a pile, then we separate. Oh, stark, flabby beetle prick, oh, money tanker, full of shit. Oh, hand me the envelope, please. So we do the beetle bump. On a sentimental journey, singing peace in Montreal, singing Bangladesh in Madison Square, cold turkey, back off Boogaloo, wings over America, coming up. We bump together, hair down to our toes, we bump apart, we hump until we're hoarse. Then we watch the circles round the bleakness of a dream. Plunk. The, be the dream is full. We did the beetle bump. I know we're not supposed to have a Q&A, but since someone has a question, does anybody else have a question that you want to ask? Not that I'm an authority. What's your favorite album? Good question. I have two, Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road. But I, you know, I like them all. Oh, uh, Brian. Right. Was Help a transitional album? Uh, in some ways, yes. Um, that song, actually, if you listen to the lyrics, because Andy Lennon had said this himself, he wrote it, it was a cry for help, you know, because they were just engulfed by this mania, called Beatle Mania. But also, he, he, he did a song, uh, You Got to Hide Your Love Away, which he was inspired by Bob Dylan to do that song. So they were transitioning into more serious uh, lyrics and, and music. Um, I think the more, the more transitional ones are Rubber Soul and Revolver, probably. Yeah. Uh, which come a little bit later. Um, George is starting to use the sitar, and, and they're getting psychedelic with Tomorrow Never Knows. You know. It's a wonderful song. I love that song. But it's basically by John Lennon. Uh, even though they agreed at the beginning that all their songs would be credited to both of them. Towards the end of their career, you could tell who wrote which or who inspired which by who did the solo. Okay. One thing I like about the Beatles is that they, they all got a chance to do solos. Yeah. And even Ringo got to use a couple of the songs he wrote before they split up. Was there another question? Um, yeah. Who was... I, I've read some things about Paul and Lennon. Who is, who is a better listener in the studio? I, I've heard that, that actually Lennon was. Is that true? That, that he was sort of more open to new ideas. Yes, he was. Yes. But, but, but since none of them read or wrote actually musical notes, uh, uh -huh. they, they relied a lot on George Martin, their producer. But then, as time went on, they would come in with ideas 
and say, you know, like the strawberry fields. Yeah, I want to do this. You know, and Martin would steer them into how, however they wanted it. You know, uh, so but I think Leonard did listen. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure if I know that he's the best listener, but right. <laughs> my favorite, if you want to know my favorite song, uh, "Day in the Life," probably from Sgt. Pepper. That's a, a John song, but he, Paul did the middle age here because John was stuck. You know which one? Now you know how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall. And I'd love to turn you on in that wonderful orchestra chord at the end. It would last forever. I used to always turn it up when it came on the radio, just so I could hear it. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here.